You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, get out, get the point. Good. And now... Fendom. Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. So do you do it all night long? (laughs) Well, have a nice day. And it's ribbed for her pleasure. Oh, my God. Every time I see that, I think, oh, Lord, somebody ain't doing something right. Whether someone's wallered out (laughs) or somebody just ain't. Uh, yeah, let's just move along. Guess what? You didn't know, but this is also Dr. Ruth. <laughs> Y'all are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on RealLibertyMedia.com, channel 3, also on the RLMRadio.xyz site, the RLM Spreaker channel, and, and lots of other rlm num num places, and later to be on the RLM YouTube and RLM BitChute, and God knows where else. Well, Grim knows. And Grim is God, as in G-A-W-D, all caps. Grimner is God. But until, (laughs) or when, whatever, I probably ought to say, hey there, hi there, ho there to everybody. And give you a real quick heads up. This is a -a 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 -a
my stream and I have I have linoleum for a flow and that's about the only flow I got so okay moving along over here on mines hey mines how you doing I don't really see anybody paying attention but thank you Real Liberty Media for sharing me and I went ahead and and reminded it so hey also here on FN site Freedoms Network and please if you can give a little oh hey if not enough donations it will be shut down uh, yay they got an extra month booyah June 23rd so get your donations in peeps they would really really appreciate it to help keep the serv pay the server fees and keep the site up freedomsnetwork.com yeah, thank you, Grimner, for sharing me over there. I really do appreciate that, hon. You're just so awesome. I also see the lovely Estrella is over here, as well as Bobby. Hi, Bobby. And Java, 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 Java Doctor is over here as well. Cool beans and Grimmy. Now, over here on Fakey Book, eh, not a whole heck of a lot of paintation going on on Fakey Book either. But that's okay, because, you know, Fakey Book is kind of sort of losing its grip. On people but I do still play over there because I have a couple pages that I have people follow me on that I can't I do get some information out that some people actually pay attention to and if I can make a difference in one person's world then booyah I've had a nice day <laughs> I've done my job for that day at least okay and now over here to Real Liberty Media where you need to be if you want to get whatever um no hun um i ain't meta enough for you <laughs> i got yeah i got crap internet sweetheart it's wi-fi and the way i get my wi-fi is off of the repeater that's on the grain elevator across the road from me so and that gets its signal from town that's 10 miles away from me so yeah yeah i got duct tape, tin can, and kite string internet. So <laughs> if I ever, ever, ever get actual, you know, because they're talking about running cable out here, fiber optic, which would be amazing. But if they, you know, and if they do, then, oh, hell yeah, I'm going to pay for it because I want decent internet. <sighs> oh, well. It's good to want. It's healthy to want. Don't mean you're going to get. That's what my mother always used to say. She also used to say, people in hell want ice water. <laughs> yeah, I love you, Mom. Okay, over here in the RLM chat, we got Barman right up top, the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world. I also see Grimner, the RLM god, don't you know, as well as the lovely Moose Girl. And Grimmy, do I remember it right that uh, no freakers ball this weekend, this Friday? Just double checking here. Uh, Vinny, from what I understand, will still be on at, is that 1 o'clock Eastern Time on Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time on Friday with the Ponder Gander. He he ganders and he ponders and then he ganders some more and then someone smacks him because he's gandering in the wrong window. <laughs> oh, well, that's because Vinny's such a goof. I also see the lovely Kate is here from the great state of Florida, as well as Asmo and the lovely Beth Z. Hey, Beth, I haven't seen you chat for a while. I, I kind of miss our little chitty chats. Oh, well, I also see Chalcedony is in the chat, as well as a double dippin', a Chloe. Um, oh, on top of a running microwave. Yeah, oh, well, that's true. Hey, if the microwave is running, don't stop it. Get it out of the house. <laughs> but um pum pum I know, piss poor joke. But my grandchildren would even moan at that one. Uh, Chloe and I were sharing gardening tips earlier, and Jay Dredd was giving a shit about it. And that's okay, because we like our zucchini. I ain't telling you what we do with it. <laughs> Hi, free enslaved. This is not an echo. This is live. It's, it's not Memorex or any of that other fun stuff. It's really for me and for true, honest and for true. I also see I'm here, at least in the chat, and kind of, sort of, uh, no Freakers Ball, no Balls to the Wall. Okay, thanks, Grim. That's this Friday. No Freakers Ball, no Balls to the Wall. So, Vinny's going to be the only one playing on Friday, because the rest of us are going to be slackers and take the weekend off. Ha, 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 ha. Yes, Vinny is a shameless self uh, that too, a promoter. But, you know, that's Vinny. He's very good at it. 
as well as being a shameless hussy. But, you know, th he's very good at that, too. And if you're going to do something, do it right. <laughs> Hi, Ibi Don C and Ibi Don C Woik. I didn't get a chat with you earlier. How did your trip go to Iowa? I hope everything went well with puppies and all that fun stuff. Java, 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 Java Doctor 2 is in the house. Hey, Java, how you doing? And looky there, JJ's my Scottish feller. I still haven't seen any pictures of you wearing a kilt, hun. Wink, wink. <laughs> Hi, Juana Taco, and what a quinky dink. I fixed taco meat before I got on the radio tonight. So, yeah, I got to finish up, you know, chopping tomatoes and lettuce and, and all that fun stuff. But I'm having taco salad for supper tonight. Booyah, booyah. I finally get a yes, Juana Taco. I get to have a taco. I also see Meister Brower is here. Hey, Woody. Hi, Woody. I also see the lovely Rain is in the house. Hi, Rain. And RLM Fluky, the Vanna White of the RLM channel. Looky there, Rob Works is in the chat. But Rob, I have not seen um, any bubbler. What the hell? Where's the bubbler? Tiny bubbles in the wine. Hi. <laughs> I almost sounded like Carol Burnett there. Sorry, Carol. Didn't mean to dish you that like that. Uh, trust no one is here. Hey, you trusty feller, as well as um, Woodman. Oh, damn. Double dose. How many more of them do we have? Holy crap and holy. Looky there. We also got Colfax 101, who's marked away. But I know you're lingering, Nenson Dubois. <laughs> That's right, free enslaved. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, let's see. Dakota 2. Hey, another new and improved. As well as Dima and Echelon and Ferris. Flash Nasty is still logged in. And there's that frumpy. He's sharing links. And I'm not sure if I want to go there. That might be scary. That might, that might, oh, oh, my God. <laughs> Those zucchinis are just about the right size for me to put in my food processor and shred them up. And then that way I can freeze them and I have plenty of zucchini for doing zucchini muffins all winter long. <sighs> I have some family members that really like zucchini and then some family members that go, ew. And so I, yeah, tough shit. But I do have people that wish to purchase because I, I make... Um, uh, da -da -da -da, stop and think here. I make gluten-free ones, too. No corn, no soy, no gluten. So, yeah, and they're quite tasty. My The FedEx guy that delivers out here told me, next time I make some, make an extra batch, and he will pay me top dollar. Top dollar. Sweet. Okay. Um, thanks, Frumpy, for that link. Okay, let me see. Goober joined. Hi, Goober. Oh, Rob is enjoying the pool these days. Well, can you blame him? I haven't gotten my pool set up yet out in the yard. I need to do that. May wind up doing that next week while I have grandbabies. I'll make them help me set up my pool so we can lounge outside and get a little sun. And I can be even more of a Neapolitan ice cream Grammy. Uh, where was I at now? <laughs> I got lost. Goober, there he is. Kozu is in the house. Hey, Kozu, as well as Meister Brower, too. So we got a trifecta of woodies. Moy, 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 moy is here, as well as Pox Box, Poxified, Pox of Poxy Phone, Poxy Home. Damn, a pox upon all who seem to think that it's way cool. To rule over others. No, rule yourself. Take care of yourself. Mind your own self. Damn it. I also see pom 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 sauces in the chat, as well as Skittle. Taste the rainbow. And Tom W. Hi, Tom W. Long time no see, sweetheart. I also see Phantom is here. And T.D. Sanders was in here earlier, and then she dropped out. Hi, T.D., if you're listening in, hon. Long time no chit chat, lady. Hope everything is going well in your world. Okay. Um, da -da. Ooh, Marga Margaritaville. My youngest has been to Margaritaville, little shithead. Shouldn't take me. Damn it. Damn it. 
Okay, now that I've said hi to everybody, I'm going to go to my pocket because I've been throwing things in there and it makes it rather difficult to walk when your pockets are that full. <laughs> um, <laughs> where do I want to go first? Mm, do I want to go with the happy news or do I want to go with the this is going to really piss you off? You know what, since I was talking about swimming pools and, you know, Rob Works is enjoying a swimming pool, let's go with this one first, shall we? It's from walked.co. How sunscreen causes cancer, not the sun. I think I spoke about this last year about this time and how uh, they're finding that some of the chemicals in sunscreen become activated when you jump into chlorinated water and they become carcinogenic. Very poisonous once you jump into that. I mean they're not good for you to start with but then when you jump in that chlorinated water they go all super tumor on you. They wait a while, but still. This is by Daisy Magnum, by the way. Thank you, Daisy. It's from the fourth of this month. A new study has found that using sunscreen is actually more dangerous than helpful. Your summer vacation may be a long way off, but it's never too soon to begin thinking of protection for your skin, which is the largest organ of your body. Now, for a lot of people, this suggests covering themselves in sunblock, which business marketing projects uh, or projects encourage at every turn. I do not, but they do. So, while we do indeed need protection to prevent sunburns, blocking out the sun is far from ideal. Rich in vitamin C, the sun offers a variety of other health benefits consisting of unusually enough cancer prevention. Yes, you need vitamin D in your system and it's not just one vitamin, you need all of them and they all need to be balanced out so that they can all work properly so that your body can use them properly and you stay healthy and you don't need drugs and all this other fun shit but oh, that's not good for Big Pharma, is it? Well, we've been taught to fear the sun, yeah. And as a result, adults and kids are soaking themselves in a bath of toxic, hormone-disrupting chemicals. Science has long revealed that exactly what we put on our skin winds up in our bodies, and rapidly. Numerous studies from across the world have analyzed sunblock, and more specifically, evaluating the active ingredients and how it permeates and soaks up into the skin after application. Now one study carried out by the Faculty of, Pharma uh, of Pharmacy at the University of Manitoba, Canada, looking into de uh, yeah, looking to develop a method for measuring typical sunscreen represent representatives, good God, Grams, slow down and actually read the words that are on the screen. Jeez, oh Pete. So, Outcomes showed a significant penetration of all sunscreen representatives into the skin, implying that these chemicals are getting in several tissues within the body. And there is a link to the source on that. On the other hand, a research study published in the Environmental Health Perspectives showed a substantial drop in hormone disrupting chemicals that are frequently discovered in individual care products after individuals switch to cleaner products. These chemicals consist of oxybenzone, tri triclosan, um, parabens, phthalates, and more. I think that's, it's so, you can learn more about that and access the research study, and there is a link, and all of these ingredients are discovered in the most popular sunscreens. So the next question ends up being, <coughs> are the components utilized to make sunblock, which is participating, or yeah, participating in our bloodstream, something to be concerned about? And science has offered us um, by the corporations who benefit from the sale of sunscreen, it states no. However, 
By now we have realized how credible such corporately funded quote unquote science is. It wasn't long ago that Johnson & Johnson, for example, was condemned for purposefully putting cancer-causing talcum powder on the marketplace. It's important to consider this article by the Huffington Post entitled, Excuse Me While I Lather My Child in This Toxic Death Cream. Even the HuffPo is doing it. In it, Mother Sarah Cayley's uh, shares how tired she feels trying to browse today's world and do the finest for her children when everything all over seems to be killing us. Uh, it is the intent, at least by those leeches that be, because how do they survive? Although I keep wondering, those leeches that be that wish to do away with the bulk of us breathers out here, um, who are they going to have to do their fetch and carry when most of those are gone? And how are they going to ensure that they aren't gone as well? I think all of those th seem to think that we need to um, do something about this population explosion ought to uh, lead the way, lead by example. Yeah, how about you call the herd by calling yourself first? Whatever you wish on others, I suggest that you start with yourself first. Isn't that caring of me? I know there's a lot of people saying, no, tough. Oh, well, <clears throat> every single purchase she produces, um, every single pur purchase she produces her kids, there is a science informing her it's excellent on the one hand and harmful on the other. Okay, that wording of that sentence is just a little bit on the wonky side. So therefore, she highlights how puzzling the consumer market has ended up being. We are awash with a wealth of info that differs from source to source on a range of different subjects, making it tough to make even the most basic of options without second guessing ourselves. It's called intuition, going with your gut. You won't second guess yourself anymore, or at least not near as much. So, we know that numerous chemicals found in sunscreens are poisonous, and we know that our skin soaks up whatever we put into it. So here are a few examples of these chemicals. Now, oxybenzone might in truth be the most problematic ingredient discovered in the majority of popular sunblocks. Used since it successfully soaks up ultraviolet light, it's likewise thought to cause hormone interruption and cell damage, which could promote cancer, could likewise thought to be almost, kind of, sort of, maybe. Why don't we be very vague with our wording here? An environmental working group states that typically, um, typically used in sunblocks, the chemical oxybenzone permeates the skin, enters the bloodstream, and imitates estrogen in the body. It can activate allergic reactions. Data is preliminary, however, research studies have actually found a link between higher concentrations of oxybenzone and health harms. One research study has actually linked oxybenzone to endometriosis in older females. Another found that females with greater levels of oxybenzone throughout pregnancy had lower birth weight daughters. Oh, that's not cool. You're affecting the child you're carrying as well. A lot of people don't realize that. <coughs> or at least it seems that way. Excuse me. There are numerous other studies out there that, um, on this chemical. For example, one research study done by the Department of Clinical Experimental Endocrinology at the University of Göttingen, Göttingen or Göttingen, it's in Germany, them, they're Germans. It observed regulatory results on receptor expression for oxybenzone, thion, the, yeah, it's a hormone disruption. <laughs> Wow, why do I always find the ones that have the big-ass words that I can't pronounce? I must be special like that. In a study by the Institute of Pharmacology and Toxicology from the University of Zurich, it identified that oxybenzone might also stimulate the impacts of estrogen in the body and promote the growth of cancer cells. 
Triggered by numerous studies, a research study out of Queensland Cancer Fund Laboratories at the Queensland Institute of Medical Research in Australia, down under. Hi, Mary B., if you're listening in. It recognized the significance of systemic absorption of sunscreens. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, researchers discovered that oxybenzone prevented cell growth and DNA synthesis and retarded cycle development in the first of the four stages of cell cycle. They determined that sunblock triggers uh, mitochondrial tension and changes in drug uptake in particular cell lines. Now, a research study published by the Journal of Health Science by the Institute of Health Sciences in Japan examines UV stabilizers used in food packages as plastic ing ingredients. Oh, that sounds icky. They discovered that some UV stabilizers in sunscreen products have estro estrogenicity in an MCF7 breast cancer cell um, along with immature rat uterotrophic assay. Mm, weird. Ick. So, they ascent, uh, evaluated a total of 11 UV stabilizers and 20 kinds of benzophones were tested utilizing the same assay to show the estrogen activity. And the list continues. We have retinol um, palmitate or vitamin A palmitate. Hmm. In a research study conducted by the U.S. government, scientists suggest that retinal palmitate, a type of vitamin A, may speed the advancement of skin tumors and sores when applied to the skin in ex um, existence of sunshine. That's not cool. Now, it's chosen by the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition for Phototoxicity and Photocarcinogenic photocarcinogenicity. <laughs> I'm going to have fun. Sorry, guys. And uh, in that screening, it was based on progressively extensive usage of this substance in cosmetic retail items for use on sun-exposed skin. And as Dr. Joseph Mercola explains, this suggests that sunscreen items might, in fact, increase the speed at which malignant cells establish and spread skin cancer. Since they consist of vitamin A and its derivatives, ret uh, retinol palmitate and retinol. Hmm. Now we also have the fragrance. Fragrance can also refer to a host of harmful hormone disrupting chemicals discussed earlier like parabens and artificial musks and yes <laughs> I know supercalifragilisticexpialidocious I can say that one poxified but man some of these big big old honker and I am like an overachiever at picking them ain't I frumpy it's like damn let's see if I can find at least one article that has words that you know most people would go fuck it Ain't going there. Excuse me, F-bomb, by the way, so early in the show. So, let's get on to the good side of this, shall we? Sun exposure can protect you from cancer. The sun isn't as bad as it's marketed to be. Corporations are worried about revenue, not people, and they're telling us that direct sun exposure can secure um, versus can, can can secure versus cancer? What? That doesn't make sense. And it isn't going to get us to purchase sunscreen. Well, no. Telling you that the sun isn't going to give you sun cancer, definitely, yeah, that's not a real good selling point. Now, some studies have made this connection, verifying that the proper quantity of direct sun exposure can safeguard against skin cancer. Now, as with anything, there is a certain limit that you can get to, and once you go over that, it's no longer good for you. Just like any kind of vitamin or any kind of mineral, if you get an imbalance going on, it starts working against you. So, a little bit goes a long way. 
and if a little bit will do good it does not equate to then a whole lot will do even better no it won't so as much as you probably already understand human beings need direct sunshine exposure for vitamin D sunburns are indeed an issue and many research studies uh, connect sunburns to cancer malignancy however due to an extensive range of factors such as cultural changes and marketing campaigns our skin has become less resistant to direct sun exposure so if you spend a significant portion of your time in the sun your skin adapts to construct a natural resistance you know as opposed to you know so instead of putting sunscreen on sun consider sunscreens the vaccine of the lotion world you know instead of you building up your own resistance your own immunity to it or what have you they're going to give you a fake one that's going to wind up being way worse than you doing it a natural so if uh, if you spend okay wait a minute I already read that so we naturally develop or we are naturally developed to get sunshine and we have reversed this and that's not a good thing there all are there are alternatives to safeguarding yourself from sunburns you can buy natural sunscreens without the damaging chemicals um, you can question quest, questioning substantial brand name ads is vital to our health and in these times of info awareness you really need to be careful read those labels peeps and you know what did you know that uh, coconut oil has SPF of 4 and it softens your skin as well only 10 percent of all cancer cases are credited to all kinds of radiation and UV is a small 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 part of that so when we think of skin cancer we immediately wish to blame the Sun however exactly what about other causes of skin cancer you know like arsenic it was discovered in a number of things we consume or work around pesticides and leather preservatives are all causes for concern sunscreens are a substantial contributor to toxic substances in the body and being taken within seconds of application they absorb in and go to work is it trivial to know that what you're taking into your body can come into your body through your skin once again that is the largest organ of your body so we now reside in a culture where we fear the Sun which is ironic considering it has developed all life on this planet it's important to keep in mind that fear ultimately ultimately manifests as reality and the Sun has lots of health benefits so using natural items will make sure that you receive these benefits while keeping you and your skin safe and if you are going to be out in the Sun get yourself a light cover-up or something you know it doesn't hurt it yeah you might get a little bit warm but then you will sweat which sweating is really good because you will perspire out toxins in your system if you are taking in enough fluids to help flush your cells but cover up a little bit more you know if you don't want to get sunburned cover up if you wish to expose your skin for a, an amount of time put some coconut oil on okay so when sh shopping for sunscreens be sure to read the labels and prevent purchasing sunblocks that contain hazardous chemicals they might be kind of difficult to find but if you go to a natural health store you can probably find some <coughs> excuse me now remember the best sun security is shade and clothing it's not needed to use sunscreen whenever you're out in the Sun sunscreen does not enable the body to take in any vitamin D from sunshine so 
If you intend on being outside for a short amount of time, avoid the sunscreen and feed your body with vitamin D to keep it healthy. And here you go. Oh, hey, it's higher now. Coconut oil has actually been revealed to provide an SPF of about 8 when it pertains to sun safety. Now, see, last article I'd read was 4, but 8, hey, I still, I'm going to go by the 4, and then that way, you know, I'll put more coconut oil on. Moisturize the skin. This info suggests that uh, although its defense is low, it does help. And if you were to apply it typical, uh, topically, it would not only use sun protection, but it would hydrate the skin, making it less vulnerable to burning. You might likewise want to attempt combining natural sunscreens with coconut oil for defense. And to do this, at the start of the day, out in the sun, use natural sunblock, and after a few hours, attempt using coconut oil to supplement the natural sunblock and hydrate the skin. So, or you can do this, the coconut oil first, then do the sunblock, and then reapply the coconut oil. And there are lots of recipes out there for uh, making your own sunblock. So, you don't really want to block it. You just want to keep your skin moisturized. So, and cover up. If it's starting to get a little bit too warm, cover up. Okay, who's selling hot cakes? Yum. Oh man, funnel cakes. Now I'm. Mmm, see, hot cakes made me think of funnel cakes. I haven't had a funnel cake in forever. <laughs> Not that I need one, but man, am I jonesing now. Thanks for that, hot cakes. Mm. So, get this shared over here on the effing site. And then, take a swig of water and go back to my pocket, because I got all kind of interesting stuff. So, let's see, where do I want to go? Do I want to go to the ethanol gravy train that I saw over in, was that on Mines or was that Twitter? That might have been Twitter. That might have, hmm, no, that was Mines. I think that was the RLM page. Um, yeah, we'll go with the ethanol one. Thank you, Real Liberty Media over on Mines for this one. It's from www.cfact.org. The ethanol gravy train rolls on, rolling, 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 keep that cursor scrolling. Okay, apparently the opponents make compelling case, but can't de um, derail or even slow this well-protected industry. Yeah, and it is very well-protected, and it's not, it's not as beneficial as those with, that uh, our proponents would like you to think. We have an ethanol plant about 15 miles from me, and yeah, it produces jobs. Other than that, makes your fuel consumption worse in your vehicle, wears out your uh, hoses and uh, rings and seal seals and all kind of stuff. It's very corrosive. But back to this article from two days ago. Like most people I've spoken with, I have no innate, inflexible and antip antipathy. Good God, I'm having trouble tonight. Apparently, I have to do a reset. <laughs> so, <clears throat> inflexible antipathy to ethanol in gasoline. I do, but this author does not. From Paul Dresden, by the way. What upsets me are the deceptive claims used to justify adding mostly corn-based ethanol to this indispensable fuel. The way, um, the way seriously harmful unintended consequences are brushed aside and the insidious crony corporatist system and ethanol program that has spawned between producers and members of Congress. Oh, yes. Can anyone say Monsatan? Although the ethanol plant here, close to me, uh, does more Milo than corn, but yes, it also does corn. 
So what angers me are the legislative and regulatory mandates that force us to buy gasoline that is 10% ethanol, even though it gets lower mileage than 100% gasoline, brings none of the proclaimed benefits of environmental or other wives, drives up food prices, and damages small engines. In fact, in most areas, it's almost impossible to find E0 gasoline, and that problem will get worse as mandates increase. Yeah, mandates, and yeah, they're still getting subsidies as well. Not as good as they used to be, but they're still getting subsidized. My past article, Lambasting Ethanol, um, and he's got links on this, addressed these issues and said ethanol epitomizes federal programs that taxpayers and voters never seem able to terminate. You know, they might have a sunset clause to them, but yeah, it's like, oh, there's a sunset clause? Well, we'll just renew that bad boy. Hmm. And ethanol, let's see, okay, never mind. Okay, no matter how wasteful or harmful they become. Now, that's primarily because its beneficiaries are well-funded, motivated, politically connected, and determined to keep their gravy train rolling, rolling, rolling down the tracks, while opponents and victims have far less funding, focus, motivation, and ability to reach the decision-making powers. So, since the decision-making powers are such total douchebags, how about we just eliminate that part right there? No, we don't need those decision-making people anymore. How about we just decide, you know, if we're going to have a monetary system, let's vote with our dollar. Oh, I know, I'm so naive. Ethanol got started because of assertions that even now are still trotted out, despite having outlived their time in the real-world sun. First, we were told that ethanol would be the bulwark against oil imports from unfriendly nations, especially as the USA depleted its rapidly dwindling pet petroleum reserves, which I call bullshit on that as well. My ex worked, or still works, in the oil and gas industry, so I call bullshit on that. And do you realize how much of our petroleum is sold to Europe. Why? Because they can make more of a profit selling it overseas than they can keeping it here and selling it at home. Yeah, assholes. <clears throat> to go on with this. And of course, you know, we have the fracking, which is horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing. That is going on out here as well, which is why we have so many more little tremors. That's what they call them, little tremors out in this neck of the woods, or at least Oklahoma and south, southern Kansas. Uh, let's see. And that revolution has given America and the world at least a century of new reserves. And the U.S. now exports more oil and refined products than it imports. Yeah, see? See? I should have just waited. It was in the article. Second, Renewable fuels would help prevent dangerous man-made climate change. Climate change! Yes, climate change is man-made, and if you fuckwee heads would stop with the spray and shit in the upper atmosphere, things would get back to normal, and maybe my grandchildren would be able to see a sky like what I saw when I was a child. You know, without all that hazy shit in it. Stop it already. Oh, excuse me. Did I go off? Yes, I did. <laughs> However, with the 2015-16 El Nino temperature spike now gone, average global temperatures are continuing the 20-year no-increase trend that completely contradicts alarmist predictions and models. Although, if you really look back, I do believe it was Time Magazine and maybe Life Magazine that were talking about how we were going into another ice age because of man-made. And we were killing the polar bears. And we're I'm not saying we ain't killing wildlife, because I'm sure we're doing a bang-up job of that shit. But... Make up our minds, will you? If you're going to be feeding us propaganda at that trough, make up our minds. 
Now, uh, also goes on to say, Harvey was the first major hurricane in a record 12 years to make U.S. landfall. And overall, the evidence-based scientific case for dangerous man-made climate change has become weaker with every passing year. Which is why <laughs> they're spraying all of that shit in the upper atmosphere. Those are contrails. They're contrails. They're not chemtrails. Duh, don't you know science? Yeah, I hear that a lot. Oh, and I just shake my head and go, if it comforts you to think that way, if it helps you sleep at night, I'm going to have to bash you. In any case, moreover, the claim that ethanol and other biofuels don't emit as much allegedly climate impacting, but certainly plant fertilizing, carbon dioxide as gasoline has also been put out to pasture. In reality, over the full life cycle from planting and harvesting crops to converting them to fuel, to transporting them by truck, to blending and burning them, biofuels emit at least as much CO2 as their petroleum counterparts. At least, which is probably making the plants go booyah, booyah. Now stop sprinkling us with the nanoparticles aluminum because that's killing us. Ironically, the state that grows the most corn and produces the most ethanol, the state whose Republican senator had a fit when EPA produce or proposed to reduce its 2018 non-ethanol biodiesel requirements by a measly 315 million gallons out of the 19.3 billion gallons in total renewable fuels, it buys less ethanol-laced gasoline than average consumers in the rest of the United States. Yeah, that's Iowa. Yeah. And guess what? Iowa is always the first place where they have primaries, or it's the first really big primary. Huh. Is that also the home base of Monsatan? I don't know. Maybe I should check that out. I have Google, but I'm too lazy to carry on. In fact, Iowans bought more ethanol-free gasoline in 2016 than what EPA projects the entire United States will buy or will be able to buy in just a few more years. And that's as the E10 mandates ratchet higher and higher. And I think it was Minnesota, those brilliant little Einsteins, edumacated idiots that live up there, Meaner Soda said that by, I think, by now, actually, I read this years and years ago, actually when they were first talking about putting the ethanol plant here, they wanted to have all vehicles E85 compatible. All vehicles. If it was not E85 compatible, they were not going to let you register it and put it on the roads. Guess what? If you don't have to register it, then I guess that's still your vehicle, huh? Because you ain't sending in ownership papers to the state and you're just borrowing it. That's pretty much what that means, too. <clears throat> to get back to this. So, in the past week, after months of battles, debates, and negotiations, POTUS Trumple Stilskin hosted a White House meeting with legislators. The purpose was to address and comp uh, compromise on at least some of the thorny, how about we say prickly, because they're all pricks anyway, the prickly issues that had put Ted Cruz, Joni Ernst, and other politicians at loggerheads as they sought to reform some aspects of the renewable fuel standards system while protecting their constituents. Yeah, 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 yeah. blah de blah de blah in an effort to expand the reform agenda, oh yeah, because any kind of government agency can't have a sunset clause, it's got to expand. It's called job security for the leeches that be. So in an effort to expand their reform agenda by making legislators and citizens better informed in advance of the meetings, 18 diverse organizations wrote a joint letter to EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt underscoring why they believe broad and significant RFS reform is essential. 
Signatories include major national meat and poultry producers and processors, restaurants, marine manufacturers, small engine owners, consumers, and taxpayer organizations, and conservative and environmental groups. They were especially worried about the prospect that Congress and the administration might allow year-round sales of 15% or E15 ethanol blends in gasoline, but they raised other pressing concerns as well. You know, as large shares of domestic corn and soy crops are now diverted from food use to fuel production, which really doesn't break my heart any because I ain't eating that shit. You know, oh, and poultry, beef, pork, and fish producers and consumers face volatile and increasing prices for animal feed. Please do not feed your critters that nasty-ass shit. Please. Because no matter how many studies they put out, there are actual studies out there that show that that garbage does go along the food chain. Ick. Ethanol wreaks havoc on engines and fuel systems of boats, motorcycles, and lawn equipment, as well as many automobiles, which are not capable or allowed to run on E15. Repair and replacement costs are a major issue for marine and small engine owners, as uh, this author discovered with his boat. Sucks to be you. Consumers and taxpayers must pay increasing costs as biofuel mandates increase under RFS. Millions of acres of native prairie and other ecosystems have been turned into large-scale agriculture developments because the RSF encourages farmers to plow land instead of preserving habitats. This endangers ecosystems and species, exacerbates agricultural runoff, and degrades water quality. And it also kills the topsoil. We are losing a lot of the nutrients in topsoil. Now, biofuel demand promotes conservation or conversion of natural habitats into palm oil and other plantations overseas, as well as domestically. <coughs> Excuse me. And their life cycle carbon dioxide emissions rival or exceed those of oil and gas. Huh. Go figure. The cure is worse than the dis-ease. Huh. Why is this not a shock? Now, expanding markets for corn ethanol by increasing E15 sales ignores and exacerbates these problems while benefiting a small subset of the U.S. economy, but negatively impacting far more sectors, including the general public and the industries and interests represented by signatories to the Pruitt letter. Following the meeting, several signatories expanded on these concerns and noted that the compromise did increase E15 sales while reducing the RFS impact on small refineries. Yeah. In other words, Rob and Peter to pay Paul, and either way, both Peter and Paul are getting screwed. Yeah. Oh, and those small refineries, they were forced to buy paper biofuel certificates because they weren't making enough gasoline to need mandated real biofuel. Now, requiring every American to buy ethanol gasoline isn't good enough for biofuel companies anymore. The National Council of Chain Restaurants remarked that now they want a waiver from federal clean air laws so that they can sell high blends of ethanol, which pollutes the air in warm weather months year-round. In warm weather months and year-round? Okay. Hmm. Arbitrarily waiving the E15 ozone emissions restrictions and permitting year-round E15 sales without comprehensive reform of the RFS, merely boosts ethanol sales and justifies further government-imposed increases to the ethanol mandate. That's from the National Taxpayers Union. These hidden taxes, damage to small engines and lower gas mileage, are a direct hit on family budgets, 
especially in poor families. And the year-round E15 policy will cause serious chaos for recreational boaters. Those I really don't feel so bad about. But hey, that's just because I don't have a boat. Over 60% of consumers falsely assume any gasoline sold at retail gas stations must be safe for their equipment. It's essential that EPA launch a public awareness campaign, improved labeling standards, and new safeguards at the pump that protect American consumers. You know, out here there is a, a refinery, or not a refinery, but a, 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 a fueling station about 50 miles south of me, that um, they blend ethanol in. So even the fuel that you're thinking that you're not getting ethanol in because it's not labeled, because if it's less, if it's 10% or less in the state of Kansas, they don't have to label it. Yeah, so everything has ethanol in it, even premium. And I used to, I used to just basically get premium. I was willing to pay that extra to know I wasn't getting ethanol. And then I found out, yeah, they're putting ethanol even in the premium. Which is why the octane went to shit. So, <clears throat> back to this article. Granting a Clean Air Act waiver for the corn ethanol industry would mean doubling down on a policy that's already been a disaster for the environment. That's from the National Wildlife Federation. And Congress needs to reform the ethanol mandate before it does more damage. In other words, just remove the fucking mandate. There's an easy solution. All you'd need is a paragraph. We hereby remove all mandates and all subsidies to ethanol production. Boom. Done. Don't need a lot of whereases and therefores and how far art thou and whatever the hell. Party of the first part and all that legalese bullshit. Just remove the mandate. Period. U.S. farmers are in a severe crisis and millions of people around the world are forced to go without food. That's from Action Aid USA. And no, the reason why a lot of people are going without food is because there's an artificial scarcity, number one. Number two is because nobody wants our genetically modified corn. They don't want it. We need policies that guarantee everyone enough food to eat, fair prices for farmers, and protect our environment. Biofuels don't do that. In fact, they make the situation far worse. And biofuels aren't the only thing that make it far worse. Every time the government steps in, you know, Department of Agriculture with all of their lovely little subsidies that they send out to farmers, you do realize that that's supposed to be keeping the market balanced so that the farmers get a better uh, bang for their, you know, their crop. They don't. I have a newspaper. I'm going to have to find that damn thing. It's somewhere in a box from the 1930s. It was in a house that I'd helped my grandpa tear down. It was in the wall. And corn prices were more then than they are now. Wheat prices were higher then than they are now. And that's not even taking into consideration the inflation difference. They were getting paid more per bushel for corn, wheat, and milo than they are now in the 30s. Yeah, and that was, yeah, then the Department of Agriculture came along and farmers started getting subsidies and they started regulating the markets and they regulated it into the toilet. Ugh. <sighs> This goes on to say that, unfortunately, a deal was struck. The noisiest and best connected warring factions got what they wanted. These other pressing concerns were ignored, as the can was once again kicked down the road. Refiners will now save hundreds of millions of dollars a year by not having to buy ethanol that they don't need to blend into smaller quantities in, of gasoline they were refining. Corn farmers and ethanol producers will rake in hundreds of millions more a year. All that is good for those industries, 
their workers and investors and the politicians who get their campaign contributions. You know, you may say that they're going to be raking in more millions more dollars, but if you look at the cost of seed, the cost of equipment, the cost of labor in producing that corn, they really aren't making any more money. They're actually losing money. Trust me, I live in farm country. So, what about the rest of America? Well, the Congress, White House, and EPA need to address our environmental and pocketbook concerns, too. When will the next negotiation session be held? Oh, sweetheart, they don't ever negotiate. They just, that's all smoke and mirrors. That's a show for you. That is a show. Free Enslaved is back. Okay. <laughs> yes, Poxified, I am dropping F-bombs. I just finally got over here to check out the chat. Okay. Ugh. This whole ethanol thing just... Uh, it's very, very infuriating. About the only benefit for it out here is, you know, when you have... Which the farmers, you know, get, well, they're at least getting something out of their crop. When you when they have a piss poor crop, they can still sell it to the, if it's corn or milo, they can still sell it to the ethanol plant. The ethanol plant not only makes um, ethanol with it, but they also made f make feed with it that they sell to feedlots in the area. So this ethanol plant is, has actually diversified a little bit and is actually paying for itself. But... I just, I have an issue with ethanol. I am not impressed with it. It is not the do-all, be-all, end-all. Like they tell you. Oh, well. Yes, I see a flasher going on. Hiya, Miss Chloe. How are you doing, lady? Okay, back to my pocket. <laughs> <coughs> Dang it. So. Mm, how about I go with something that's a little bit better. A little bit happier. I can't stick with the, the nasty stuff for too long. It pisses me off and then I get cranky mood. And Although I can go out and, and uh, pull weeds and alleviate some of that frustration. In any case, this is from um, do what works for your health and fitness dot com. Non GMO corn offers far more nutrition without the poison. Hey nineteen thirteen corn is one hundred percent farmer owned. But in twenty thirteen corn is ninety five percent corporation owned and 90% GMO. Although out here, there are an awful lot of uh, fields that are starting to sh have signs up that say not herbicide tolerant, which basically means it's not GMO. <coughs> now this basically has a lot of links to it and I'm gonna go ahead and share this with you guys so that you can check it out at your leisure. Yes, dear. I'm having an awesome evening. Thank you, Chloe. So, and I'll put this over on the effing site as well. It's basically a bunch of links that y'all can check out, and it is it is good news. So, now, back to my list. Here we go with another one. From dailynativenews.site It's the herb that's 100 times stronger than chemo drugs and kills cancer in two days. Oh, uh, and here we go. <laughs> and I just have a bunch of those little babies in my yard. The root of this plant 
is able to eliminate cancer cells and protects the rest of the cells. It's an amazing news for people who are suffering from cancer. Under a scientific study, it's observed that the consumption of dandelion tea can help you dissolve the cancer tumor in just two days. It's very welcoming news for cancer patients, and dandelion is well known for its medicinal properties and health benefits. It's very simple to make dandelion tea, and additionally, along with cancer, dandelion tea is capable of curing many other ailments. But we can't say cure because then the FDA steps in and says, must be a drug if it can cure. My body must be a drug then because my body can cure itself if I give it the proper fuel. Assholes at the FDA. Another squirrel moment brought to you by a Grammy. Now, researchers have found that dandelion root is more efficient than chemotherapy. An experimental study led by researchers at the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, the University of Windsor, Canada, has affirmed that the foundation of this plant can take out tumor cells and secures whatever is left of the cells. There is most, uh, there is most likely this data will fulfill tumor patients. The base of dandelion can successfully wipe out disease cells in under two days. On account of the outcome that they have, these researchers could get support for another study that would give more replies about the proficiency of dandelion root and how we can get the greater part of it. Now, you ever stop to wonder why they keep telling you dandelion is a noxious weed? Dandelion is unsightly in your yard. You don't want to have dandelions in your yard. I wonder when that nonsense started. The 72-year-old John DiCarlo had benefits of this root. He had cancer and treated it for almost a month. But he changed something when he tried the dandelion tea. He was in remission after four months. Pass on this outstanding information among your loved ones so that they can do the maximum cancer patient uh, treatment and take advantage of the simple treatment. And the advantage of this treatment is that it's free from side effects and cure cancer quickly as compared to the conventional methods. And my sister-in-law, I shared an article about this the other day. I guess it's about a week or so ago, but my sister-in-law said she was out in the yard um, picking dandelion flowers, and she made a tea out of it, and she said it really is quite tasty. And I'd watched a video the other day on making dandelion tea, and the gal was talking about growing your own stevia as well, and I thought, oh, I need to find out where I can get either stevia seeds or get stevia starts or something. I grow my own stevia too. I'd be a happy little camper. I can grow my own shit. I grow my own. Moy, 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 moy has joined. Hi, moy. <coughs> Let's see. Frumpy, are you moving to Florida? Duh. Let's see. Put this over in the effing side as well. I do love my dandelions. You know, I have loved dandelions like forever. I mean, we used to we used to take um, pluck the flowers, you know, from as close to the ground as we could, try and find ones with the longest stems and make little dandelion bracelets that we'd wear all the time when we were kids. Probably what kept us healthy. You know, skin exposure. So, okay, we'll do this. And, oh, hey, I'll do that one since it's a flower. Okay. Damn, got tickled again. Hmm, imagine that. So, now that I've found a couple of fun things, things that will work, things that are awesome, how about we go with this one? I know it's kind of scary. It's kind of scary. I'm going to be talking about Mechihuana. 
You know that demon weed, the devil's salad. This is from ushealthmags.com. Cancer Institute finally admits that marijuana kills cancer. Huh. Cancer kills nearly 600,000 Americans per year. Can you say culling the herd? And this year alone, over 1.6 million people will be diagnosed. So much time and research has gone into the cure of cancer in the last few decades. Basically, it's gone into the studying of how cancer develops and all of this other fun shit and how we can come up with drugs and not wanting to cure because if you cure, you have no repeat customers. So, <coughs> yet, because of the stigma associated with marijuana, this wonder plant has been largely ignored by governments and researchers as a potential cure. Or a key piece to the cure at least. Now the admission was in August of 2015 the National Cancer Institute or NCI released a report on its website which stated marijuana kills cancer. Yes, I read that right. Marijuana kills cancer. Now we know that cannabis can be used for medicinal purposes to relieve symptoms of many chronic illnesses and in fact, marijuana has actually been used for medicinal purposes for over 3,000 years. Dude, that's way before Doritos were invented. I have no idea what they did with the munchies then, but eh. The potential benefits of medicinal cannabis for people living with cancer and other chronic illness include anti-nausea, appetite stimulation, pain relief, and improved sleep. And I tell you what, I do understand the improved sleep because all I got to do is one toke and I'm out. Within 10 minutes, I'm done. I'm done. It just puts my ass to sleep. I don't even have time to get the munchies anymore. It just knocks my ass out. Am I complaining? No. <laughs> so, how does cannabis kill cancer? Well, there's 21 chemical components found in marijuana called cannabinoids. And these chemical, uh, chemicals activate specific receptors found throughout the body to produce pharmacologic effects in the central nervous system and the immune system. Now, this is um, physiological and biochemical changes in the body produced by a drug in therapeutic concentration. Now, THC, or the delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinoidal, or, can, yeah, cannabi, cannabinol, there you go, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinoidal, there you go, whatever, cannabinol, <laughs> I'll get it spit out yet. It is the primary psychoactive ingredient found in marijuana. However, there are components such as cannabinoidal or cannabin cannabinol, which is CB CBN or cannabin cannab Okay, frumpy. <laughs> I need someone to smack me upside the head because obviously my mouth is no longer functioning when it comes to these. So, CBN, CBD, CBC, CBG, and tetrahydrocannabinol. <laughs> Thank you for the shorter little alphabetical version. And Delta 8 THC. And they all have pharmacological effects. For example, CBD is known to have significant analgesic and anti inflammatory activity without the high of THC. Now, during a two year study, groups of mice and rats were given various doses of THC by tube feeding and they were all going like dude seriously we could give shit less if you ring a bell just bring us some munchies okay tests were also done on a variety of cancerous cells cancerous cells went eek and the mice went that's what I said <laughs> so what they found is that cannabinoids may reduce tumor growth by causing cell death blocking cell growth 
and blocking the development of blood vessels needed to grow tumors. Blockers, blockers. Now, lab tests on animals have shown that cannabinoids may be able to kill cancer cells while protecting normal cells. Thank you, Rob Works. And yes, Dandy Wino. The little old Dandy Wino me. Um, you know, we never really, Mom never did salad or anything like that with dandelions, but we used to eat the flowers. And there was a couple of, um, There was a couple of recipes on different things that you can do with the dandelion flowers. And uh, she made a, a, a dandelion, um, oh, you know, where you, where you have the flowers and you, you put them in a jar and then you cover them with vinegar and uh, you have to uh, uh, shake them a couple of times a day for a couple of weeks. And it's like making your own... Well, it's a little poultice, I guess. Not a poultice. It's something wonderful. You know, and put a little bit of honey in there. It's basically apple cider vinegar, honey, and dandelion flowers is what she used. And then, you know, you just pour enough of the uh, um, vinegar in to cover the dandelion uh, flowers in the jar. And then you put several tablespoons of honey in there as well. I would think it would be awesome for, you know, using it as a salad dressing. Um, and you get the benefits because it pulls all of that goodness out of the dandelion. So, yum! In any case, back to this article. Chitty chatting with the chitty chatters. Thank you once again, Rob Works, for that puff puff pass. Pay no attention to me if I start snoring. Guess what happens? Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Huh. Cannabinoids may protect against inflammation of the colon and may have potential in reducing the risk of colon cancer and possibly in its treatment. And a laboratory study of THC in liver cancer cells showed it damaged or killed the cancer cells. Same study of THC in models of liver cancer showed that it had anti-tumor effects and CBD make uh, may make chemotherapy more effective. I would just step away from the chemotherapy. That was a poison that was dropped on people in World War I. Step away. Step away. Now, um, there's a men's study that proves, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> need a drink of water. So there's a men's study that proves that cannabis can potentially kill cancer and an analysis of 84,170 participants looked at the association between cannabis use and the occurrence of bladder cancer. Over 16 years, they found 89 cannabis users developed bladder cancer compared to 190 of the men who did not report cannabis use. Now, after dividing the study up by age, race, ethnicity, and body mass index, cannabis use was associated with 45% reduction in bladder cancer incidence. And if you actually corrected your diet, that would probably reduce the bladder cancer incidence even more. So, in conclusion, many studies have shown the potential of cannabis being able to kill cancer cells However, little of these studies have been tested on humans. Only a handful of clinical trials have been held with humans, so it's too soon to say if the effects will work as well in humans. I'm thinking it's be a good time practicing on yourself, though. The good news is, work is being done, and the topic is gaining interest among researchers. So, <coughs> booyah! Bonus round, Mother Nature's Pharmacy steps up once again. <coughs> Excuse me. Hmm. Ah, uh, Rob, you don't drink coffee? 
I gotta have my Java 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 in the morning. Although I did, I also got a recipe for uh, making uh, coffee with dandelion roots, and so I'm gonna. You have to, you have to dry them and then grind them. But hey, it's worth a shot. Okay. Back to my pocket I go, and then soon I'm going to have to go to the pig. So, okay, I did that one. <coughs> okay. This one is from investmentwatchblog.com. And it's actually from August of 2011, but I don't think anything has really changed since then. Did you know that before 1973, it was illegal in the U.S. to profit off of health care? The Health Maintenance Organization Act of 1973, passed by Tricky Dick, changed everything. So, is health insurance business a racket? Yes, literally it is. Even more so now that Dingleberry Death Care got put in. So, and this is why the shameless pandering to robber baron corporations posing as health providers is such an egregious and obvious tactic to do nothing more than plump up insurance company profits Probably those insurance companies either own the uh, health providers or are owned by. That way they're covering multiple ends of the spectrum on this shit. Do you know who to blame? <coughs> yes. Oh, oven fried green tomatoes. Yum. You know, I finally tried green tomatoes, fried green tomatoes, um, probably about five years ago. And oh my goodness, they are yum. Yum, yum, Chloe. Thank you. Okay, back to my. So. Do you know who it is to blame? Believe it or not, the downfall of American health insurance system falls squarely on the shoulders of Popo Tricky Dicky Nicky, Richard Nixon. In 1973, Nixon did a personal favor for his friend and campaign financer, Edgar Kaiser, then president and chairman of Kaiser Permanente. Nixon signed into law the Health Maintenance Organization Act of 1973, in which medical insurance agencies, hospitals, clinics, and even doctors could begin functioning as for-profit business entities instead of the service organizations they were intended to be. <coughs> and which insurance company got the first taste of federal subsidies to implement HMO A73? Well, it was Kaiser Permanente. What are the odds? Who'd have thunk? That's just a quinky dink. Apparently, um, to perfectly cement HMO A73 as the profiteering boondoggle that it actually was, the law Nixon mandated also included clauses that encouraged medical providers to not cure afflictions, but to prolong them by only treating the symptoms. There's no money to be made in curing sickness, but the sky's the limit when it comes to forcing people to endure repetitive doctor's visits endless and often useless and redundant tests, and of course, let's not forget, the ever-increasing demand for American-made prescription drugs. So have you noticed recently that the words prolonged coma and death have wormed their way into the fast-spoken side effects list of just about every new drug you see on television or hear on the radio? In some cases, death may occur in the unlikely event. 
that you die before we can milk your bank account dry. Well, our bad. Oh, wait a minute. Congress gave us a pass on that. You can't sue us either. <laughs> mm. So, from the medicines that's supposed to cure you, you know what? Death! I'll take restless legs over death any day. Or how about toenail fungus? Because, yeah, I actually, back when I still had, years ago, when I still had commercial TV, um, I actually saw a commercial for toenail fungus, and one of the possible, in the unlikely event, side effects was death. For toenail fungus. Are you shitting me? Get you a jar of mentholatum. Dumbasses. Oh, well. <clears throat> Thank you, Kiki, Kiki. My kitty cat's trying to help me. So, uh, back to this article. Ow, rascal. Now, <clears throat> where was I at? Okay, so it's an arms race between insurers who deploy software and manpower trying to find claims they can reject and doctors and hospitals, because, you know, once you make a claim, then they start making all kind of little nitpicky stipulations. Kind of like house insurance and car insurance, too. Insurance is a racket, no matter what industry it's supposed to be insuring you for. So, <clears throat> oh, and doctors and hospitals, yeah, who deploy their own forces in an effort to outsmart or challenge the insur insurers. Yeah. Oh, and wait, there's more. You have the cost of this arms race ends up being borne by you, the general public. The general public. That's in the form of higher health care prices and higher insurance premiums because, well, you're supposed to pay those premiums, but once you make a claim, sorry, we're going to have to raise premiums because we got to make a profit somehow. Of course, rejecting claims is a clumsy way to deny coverage. The best way is for the insurer to avoid paying medical bills is to avoid selling insurance to people who really need it. Oh, sorry, you have a pre-existing condition. Sorry. Not. Or an insurance company can accomplish this in many ways, or at least two, through marketing that targets the healthy and through underwriting. Rejecting the sick or charging them higher premiums. Do you see the pattern? Oh joy, oh bliss. He did not earn the nickname Tricky Dick for nothing. Just saying. Um, Chloe, the only permanent rights you have are the rights that you uh, routinely exercise, hon. No one can take rights away from you. You have to allow them to have them. You have to acquiesce. So, that's the problem. And there's entirely too many people out there that seem to think that because this fictitious, fictitious entity called government says so, and they wrote it on a piece of paper, a bunch of squiggles and lines with a bunch of legalese bloody bloody bullshit, um, that that means it's true, and you have to. You have to, whether you like it or not, even if it kills you. Kiss my ass. Okay, it's about that time of the evening. I need to find the pig. See what happened this date in history. What's going on over here on the pig? Looks like they are feeling rather piggish. PIGazette.com Popo Trumpelstilskin is doing his best to make America great again, despite fierce resistance from jackass party hooligans, swamp rats, and unabashed Marxist media using howling mobs, politicized judges, plus the infamous deep state. The Trump-hating asshats fight our POTUS at every turn. I fight your POTUS at every turn, too, because I think he's an ass hat. So, but that's just me personally. Or maybe not just me personally. So, 
back to. Their word of the day over here on the pig is actually two words. It is a phrase, public utility. It is a noun. It's a safe haven for term-limited city and county officials who never get tired of screwing taxpayers. Yeah. <clears throat> In the quotable quotes section over here on the pig, asked if Donald Trump was framed... Nunez said, well, first of all, I believe they never should have opened a counterintelligence investigation into a political party. Why would you want to do that anyway? Because they're all having a party and it's on our dime. Counterintelligence investigations are very rare, or are, very rarely do they happen. And uh, when they do happen, you have to be very careful because you're using the tools of our intelligence services and relationships with other countries in order to spy on a political campaign. Probably not a good idea. That's from the House Intelligence Committee Chairman, Devin Nunez. Nunez, who's a rebloodlican from California. In their tasty tidbits, this is true, and apparently a representative of the Pennsylvania Department commented that they should have checked the dam before sending the letter. Although a person can see what's coming in the state letter, the reply is very clever. So, the dam. There are pictures here. This was an actual letter sent to a man named Ryan DeVries regarding a pond on his property. It was sent by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Quality, State of Pennsylvania. This guy's response is hilarious, but read the state's letter before you get the yada 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 yada. So the state's letter is, Dear Mr. DeVries, It has come to the attention of the Department of Environmental Quality that there is has been recent unauthorized activity on above-referenced parcel of property, and you have been certified as the legal landowner and or contractor who did the following unauthorized activity. Construction and maintenance of two wood debris dams across the stream outlet of Spring Pond. A permit must be issued prior to the start of this type of activity. A review of the department's files shows that no permits have been issued. Therefore, the department is determined that this activity is in violation of Part 301 Inland Lakes and Streams of the Natural Resources and Environmental Protection Act, Act 451 of the Public Acts of 1994, being sections 324.30101 to 324.30113 of the Pennsylvania Compiled Laws Annotated. The department has been informed that one or both of the dams partially failed during a recent rain event causing debris and flooding at downstream locations. We find that dams of this nature are inherently hazardous and cannot be permitted. The department therefore orders you to cease and desist all activities at this location and to restore the stream to free flow condition by removing all wood and brush forming the dams from the stream channel. All restoration work shall be completed no later than January 31st, 2018. Please notify this office when the restoration has been completed so that the follow-up site inspection may be scheduled by our staff. Failure to comply with this request or any further unauthorized activity on the site may result in this case being referred for elevated enforcement action. Dun, dun, dun. We appreciate and would appreciate your full cooperation in this matter. Please feel free to contact me at this office if you have any questions. Sincerely, David L. Price, District Representative of Water Management Division. And the actual response that Mr. DeVries sent back. Dear Mr. Price, your certified letter dated 11-17-17 has been handed to me. I am the legal landowner, but not the contractor at the 2088 Daggett Lane Trout Run, Pennsylvania. Couple of beavers are in the uh, state unauthorized process of constructing and maintaining two wood debris dams across the outlet stream of my spring pond. Now, 
While I did not pay for, authorize, nor supervise their dam project, I think they would be highly offended that you call their skillful use of nature's building products debris. I would like to challenge your department to attempt to emulate their dam project anytime and or any place you choose. I believe I can staf safely state that there is no way you could ever match their dam skills, their dam resourcefulness, their dam ingenuity, their dam persistence, and their dam determination and or their dam work ethic. These are the beavers slash contractors you are seeking. As you request, I do not think the beavers are aware that they must first fill out the dam permit prior to the start of this type of dam activity. My first dam question to you is, number one, are you trying to discriminate against my spring pond beavers? Or, number two, do you require all beavers throughout the state to conform to said dam requests? If you are not discriminating against these particular beavers, through the Freedom of Information Act, I request completed copies of all the other applicable beaver dam permits that have been issued. Perhaps we will see if there really is a dam violation of Part 301, Inland Lakes and Streams of the Natural Resources and Environmental Protection Act, Act 451 of the Public Acts of 1994, being Sections 324.30101 to 324.30113 of the Pennsylvania Compiled Laws Annotated. I have several dam concerns. My first dam concern is, Aren't the beavers entitled to legal representation? The spring pond beavers are financially destitute and are unable to pay for said representation, so the state will have to provide them with a dam lawyer. The department's dam concern that either one or both of the dams failing during the recent rain events causing flooding is proof that this is a natural occurrence which the department is required to protect. In other words, we should leave the spring pond beavers alone rather than harassing them and calling their dam names. So, if you want the dammed stream restored to a dam free flow condition, please contact the beavers. But, if you're going to arrest them, they obviously did not pay any attention to your dam letter, they being unable to read English. In my humble opinion, the spring pond beavers have the right to build their unauthorized dams as long as the sky is blue, the grass is green, and the water flows downstream. They have more dam rights than I do to live and enjoy spring pond. If the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Protection lives up to its name, it should protect the natural resources, beavers, and the environment, beavers dams. So, as far as the beavers and I are concerned, this damn case can be referred for more elevated enforcement action right now. Why wait until 1.31 of 2018? The spring pond beavers may be under the damn ice by then, and there will be no way for you or your damn staff to contact or harass them. So, in conclusion, I would like to bring to your attention to a real environmental quality health problem in the area. It's the bears. The bears are actually defecating in our woods. I definitely believe you should be persecuting the defecating bears and leave the damn beavers alone. And if you're going to investigate the beaver dam, watch damn step because the bears are not careful where they dump. Being unable to comply with your dam request and being unable to contact you on your dam answering machine, I'm sending this response to your dam office. Thank you, Ryan DeVries and the Dam Beavers. Excellent job, Ryan. Excellent job. Now, for this date in history, the 16th of May, 1928, Baseball manager slash player Billy Martin born. George Steinbrenner fires him. Damn it. Didn't even start working and he got fired. Just out of the womb. Holy crap. And this date in history, the 16th of May, 1986, 
Dallas jumps the shark and creates a magnificent splash when it brings Bobby Ewing back from the dead. Creativity surrenders. And then we had reality TV. And the shit keeps rolling downhill. Oh, well. Thank you, boys, over here on the pig. You always come up with such interesting things for me to peruse. What is this? I'm reading a little bit. Oh, somebody went on an I remember thing. I remember this is part of their, uh, what is that called? Um, top story. I remember. Once upon a time, before the nanny state and the electronic babysitter sucked the life out of them, kids were free to squeeze every ounce of fun out of life. Ranging far and wide, they always found something to do. If they didn't have enough people for a regulation sport, they made up their own game. In that distant era, a parent's challenge wasn't getting little Johnny or Moonbeam off the couch. The struggle was capturing their young'uns when it was time for them to come home. A child growing up in that bygone era had it all. There were highs and lows. There were thrills and spills. Most important of all, there was the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Growing up had all that and more, all of which shaped an individual's character. I also remember there was a time when little girls were allowed to be just that, a little girl. They weren't tarted up in slutty clothes and hooker makeup, then put on display at a wenchlet pageant by a stage mommy who deliberately made baby girl a child molester's wet dream. Yeah. I remember, once upon a time, the rank-and-file American had a much thicker hide. They knew the difference between colorful hyperbole and the deliberate insult and didn't set their hair on fire over either of them. Blessed with a robust sense of humor, they invariably laughed at the wrong things, and afterwards they might grin sheepishly, then laugh again. I remember once upon a time the IRS was a government cabal with its one item on the agenda. If you're thinking that one item was rigging elections for the jackass party, guess again. In the distant past, their only function involved collecting taxes for Uncle Sam, a.k.a. Uncle Sugar. I remember once upon a time an automobile was more than mere transportation. It was a legitimate piece of art. <clears throat> there were motorized bling before bling was even a gleam in a rapper's eye. In the late 1950s, Ford Motor Company swam against the prevailing assembly line tide when it hired skilled craftsmen to build the Continental Mark II by hand. That's a work of art. I remember, once upon a time, a real-life hero named Jonas Salk devised a vaccine that eradicated the vile childhood-destroying um, disease, polio. Sweetheart, that was, I, I hate to tell you this, but polio is not a disease. Polio is, um, was caused by heavy metal toxin poisoning. Mm -hmm. Jonas Salk invented the vaccine, but <clears throat> no, sorry. Do some research, honey. I remember once upon a time that there were these repositories of books. No, I'm not talking about the public library, although they had a collection of books that were for sale. It was a genuine thrill to pick up, um, to pick up a book, leaf through it, even read a page or two before you made a selection. The magical thing about a bookstore is the fact that the selection of books varied from one store to the next, depending upon the reading taste of the store owner. Now, don't get us wrong. We the pigs don't hate everything about the 21st century. For example, the Internet. For a scribbler like me, it's a time saver. Instead of spending hours and days in the public library searching for some elusive facts, I can 
bing my way to a cyberspace outpost that has exactly what I need. From noble to profane, cyberspace has it all. Its impact on you depends entirely on how you use it. Skype. When I was working on a module for the Austrians, Skype made the job much easier. Thanks to screen sharing, I could let them see intermediate test results instantly. Without Skype, we would have missed our delivery date and they would have missed the NASA launch window of their instrumentation package. DVR, my lovely bride, oh Hambo, bless your heart, would be lost without this extremely user-friendly miracle of modern entertainment technology, which, you know, once I, when I still had TV, I liked DVR. I could zip through the commercials. We hope that you enjoyed Pig's Blast from the past. Apparently, they enjoyed writing it as well. And now, with profound regret, we return you to objective reality, where we, the people, are wondering, aren't Stormy's allotted 15 minutes expired yet? I think they have, Hambo. I think they have expired. If you guys want to read more, come on over to PIGazette.com. They've got all kinds of different pages. they got the Piggish Grab Bag. they got Hambo's Hammer, Porcus's Pitchfork. Um, let's see, the Prattler. Do you still have the Prattler or do you just... Yeah, you still have the Prattler. And you know what? They even have a link for me off to the left-hand side and a link for Circle's artwork, too. So, all kinds of way cool things going on over here on the pig. I don't necessarily agree with them with everything. Actually, about it's getting to be about 50-50, but I still enjoy their writing style. And they come up with some shit that makes me go, wow, how fun is that? So, come on over to PIGazette.com and check it out. Those guys are fun. Okay, let me get back to my pocket now and see... Um... How about that's worldtruth.tv. Don't know that I want to go there. Oh, do we want to? Yeah, we'll go there. This is it's, it's seen as how it is wackadoodle Wednesday. And this is pretty freaking wackadoodled. I mean totally freaking wackadoodled. It's from the mirror.co.uk. And it's actually from October of last year. Model turns her labia into necklace after they were cut off in designer vagina surgery. I didn't know there was such a thing. But apparently there is. Because it's on the internet, so it must be true. So, <clears throat> we all have keepsakes that we treasure to remember special moments in our lives. From teddies to train tickets. Now for Tracy Kiss, her labiaplasty surgery 10 months ago marked the end of a life of long-term suffering. And so, wanting to have something to remind her of this monumentous occasion in her life, she asked her surgeon if she would be allowed to keep her severed labia, labia minora, or inner lips. Y'all getting this? The 29-year-old from Buckinghamshire likens it to keeping her children's milk teeth, locks of hair, or their first baby gross, whatever the hell that is, and, well, her silicone breast implants. Okay. Tracy is a former glamour model and single mum of two. She suffered with pain and tenderness her whole life from her protruding labia. But she didn't realize anything was wrong because nobody talks about it. Now, as a result, I'd missed out on so many hobbies and interests that I love and had to be mindful with tight clothing, exercise, and intercourse because of the discomfort it caused simply because I didn't know anything could be done about it. I thought all women were just as tender as I. But after realizing that something could be done, Tracy turned to surgery in December of 2016. And she had her labia removed. 
and it changed her whole life. Now there are pictures, so I'm warning you. I know that keeping body parts may not be to everybody's taste, Tracy explains. However, my collection began when having children and finding my feet as a tooth or finding my feet as a tooth fairy, which led to me also keeping silicone breast implants after my emergency breast reduction five years ago. And for a while, Tracy kept her labia floating in a jar on her kitchen dresser. But they didn't keep well. Well, not as well as she had hoped. So, however, with time, the cut-off tissue had discolored from pink to a pale gray. It had crinkled up in the surgical fluid and turned curly, which has made them less of a trophy and more of a Halloween accessory. So I've been looking into ways to more effectively preserve them long term. Tracy started making crystal jewelry with her nine-year-old daughter, learning how to set resin effectively and practicing by creating glittery necklace pendants and jewels. Now, once she had perfected her craft, Tracy set about drying out her labia on a makeshift washing line using Christmas card pegs, an ice cream box, and cotton string. There's pictures, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> she applied several coats of textured pearl finished paint, red to match her bold nails, and lipstick, then dried them with a hair dryer and then dusted them off with glitter. Tracy then set the labia into resin using an oval shaped mold, and voila, she had a necklace pendant ready. The model and blogger shared her story to raise awareness about circumcision in the hope that no other mother or woman suffer for so long the way she did. She wrote, My labia has been successfully preserved. They are colorful, bright, and cheerful, and mark the end of my suffering. One step closer to breaking down the taboo of female circumcision through a unique talking point and bespoke jewelry that I will cherish forever. Wow. If that ain't wackadoodle, I don't know what is. So, y'all been listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on RealLibertyMedia.com channel 3 and also on the RLM Radio Spreaker channel and lots of other RLM and um, and um places. I will not be around on Friday. I will be grand baby in. So no rocket chair on Friday and also no freakers ball or balls to the wall on Friday. But Vinny will be here for the ponder gander or the gan p gander ponder. Or Vinny will be around on Friday. Also no dork table on Saturday. So you pretty much got a free weekend, at least until Sunday at noon, when I'm thinking Grammy's probably going to jump in and he's going to be playing some tunage, some blues, and there'll probably be a rousing game of trivia going on in the chat over here on the RLM. And that will lead you into Hal Anthony, who's going to open up a can of whoop-ass on yo ass behind the woodshed. Then... Sunday evening, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, Gary Ellen Gigi's Boo with The Road Less Traveled. I will be back next week, Wednesday, for another edition of Grammy's Rocketeer on this weird wackadoodle Wednesday. But until then, oh, let's see. And I won't be around that uh, that Friday either because, yeah, it's Memorial Weekend. And who'd have thunk of going somewhere on Memorial Weekend? But, yeah, I will have grandbabies. Also, next week, Wednesday, I will have my grandchildren here. So don't be surprised if the grandbabies jump on and have a say or two while we're go doing the radidio thing. So uh, let me see. I still got a couple minutes. Yeah, I know. That is just totally weirdness. And I don't, you know, there's there's just some things that I would not know. Some things you do not accessorize. That was just, that woman is just weird. Now, I do have, let me go to Oopie real quick. See if I got one little quickie here. Oh, hey, another lottery guy. 
lottery guy. Man discovers $5,000 lottery prize was actually $50,000. 50, a Maryland man who thought he'd won $5,000 on a lottery ticket said um, his jackpot was actually fifty or 50000 Way cool. Solomon Zuwudi of Oxen Hill told Maryland lottery officials that he was overjoyed when he scratched off the cash craze doubler ticket that he'd bought from St. Barnabas Gulf in Oxen, Oxen Hill and revealed what he thought was a $5,000 prize. He said that he was so excited it took him a while before he scratched off the rest of the ticket and discovered his prize was actually 50000 I still can't believe it, he said. This is just a dream to me. I was expecting just twenty-five, But 50000 is way better. Oh, talk about a return on your investment. Yeah, and Uncle Sugar's going to take at least half of that, hon. Don, honey, I would think it was fake except for looking at the pictures. It's just kind of gross. It's kind of gross, but uh, I I don't know what, how she preserved them, but it's look at the pictures, hon. You'll be grossed out. In any case, thanks, y'all, for listening in this evening. I hope you have an absolutely amazing rest of your day and rest of your week. I will be popping in in the chat off and on until about noon on Friday. But uh, until then, till I see you again, please remember... I truly do love you all, and I wish you all enough. Good night.